gonna have a good line in my head. I feel like I'm at a bit of a disadvantage here because I've been thinking about what the internet meant uh, in a relatively deep way and driving way since one night in the summer of 1984 when I finally, after a lot of trouble and effort, managed to get the rubber suction cup that I had attached to my phone to connect to my compact, luggable computer <laughs> and issue commands at 300 bits per second and make a hard disk spin in Washington, D.C. And I realized for the first time that I was seeing the nervous system that I'd been thinking about ever since I read a French theologian and, and uh, Jesuit priest named Tyre de Chardin back in college, who had said that there was a purpose to evolution and that that evolutionary trajectory was headed toward the collective organism of mind, that in his very Catholic way of looking at it, that human beings collectively would come together and create a consciousness that was capable of keeping God company. And I felt like he was right about that when I read it in college. I was taking a lot of acid at the time, so things like that. <laughs> Easy. One of the great things about writing for the Grateful Dead is you don't have to pretend you're not an acid dead. <laughs> like many of you do. Um, that's another subject altogether. But uh, the the vision that I had then stayed with me for almost 20 years of, of running a very large and broke cattle ranch in Wyoming. And when I got online, I thought, this is it. This is the thing that is going to create the collective organism of mind. But in the meantime, what this thing might do is make it possible one day. And this is a time, I suppose, there weren't a million people that had email addresses. But I could see that one day, everybody on the planet would assemble in the space that was being created by these machines collectively wired together. And that all of those people would be endowed, if things worked right, with the right and indeed the ability to say what was ever, whatever was in their hearts, so that anybody else on the planet could hear it, and nobody would be in a position to shut them up. And at the same time, everybody would be in a position not to have to listen to what they had to say, which had not exactly been the case during the previous century of broadcast media, which had contributed to some of the greatest atrocities human beings had ever managed to devise. And that, moreover, what was going to happen with this, with this new way of communicating was going to be the end of reality distortion fields that could be thrown up around bodies of information and had been as long as there had been information. The ability to get large numbers of people to think that there was only one way to think and there was only one book to read. There was only one God that spoke to us. And he spoke like this was about to be over. That the great white column of monotheism with God on top and you on the bottom was about to get seriously kicked around by the pantheism of this growing horizontal web of inner human connection. So I had that vision, and I got online, got increasingly better bandwidth, uh, though it always doesn't seem like enough. <laughs> it's in the nature of, of a lot of things, I guess. The more you got, the shorter it feels. But uh, <laughs> something to think about here in Marin County. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, 
not too many years later, uh, I, by an odd set of circumstances, found myself as the scoutmaster to a group of people who called themselves the Legion of Doom, who were actually mostly 14-year-old boys who were trying to violate the forbidden by hacking into various parts of the phone network because they couldn't figure out how to violate the real forbidden that they wanted. <laughs> and the government was coming down on them with a vigor and force that was kind of, I thought, over the top. I mean, one of them was held at gunpoint. Uh, well, if one of them came home and found that his 12-year-old sister had been held at gunpoint by about 10 members of the Secret Service, well, they carted out of the house every single electronic device they could find, including a clock radio, and all of his Metallica tapes, for example, as evidence that he was definitely using them for storage of uh, God knows what it was they were trying to stop him from doing. And I then had a visit from the FBI myself where I had to spend probably an hour explaining to Agent Baxter from the Rock Springs field office that I couldn't very well have committed this crime. Uh, but in order for me to do that, I had to show him what the crime it was what crime it was that he was investigating, which he didn't understand. <laughs> and I've, I've never been very comfortable when I see well-armed, insecure men wandering around places they don't understand. <laughs> I mean, I'm from Wyoming, you know. <laughs> happens. And uh, so I, I wrote something about this and put it on the well, which was referred to earlier. And uh, there it was read by a friend of mine uh, Mitch Kapor, who, uh, who literally dropped out of the sky in his business jet one afternoon and, and, and said he had a visit from the FBI too, and it had filled him with such a sense of, of unease that he wanted to know everything I knew about the kids in the Legion of Doom and a number of other things, and we started the Electronic Frontier Foundation in July of 1990, 21 years ago. So I've spent all this time since thinking about the practicalities of the relationship between cyberspace and the physical world, and how to mediate that relationship now as practically everybody who's in the physical world is also in cyberspace. And they are all obviously intimately connected. Cyberspace has the same relationship to the physical world that the mind does to the body. You can't really have one without the other at this point. But, you know, they're different in some fundamental ways. The physical world has a hard time grasping that concept because all of the existing power relationships on the planet are being renegotiated at this moment by virtue of the fact that anybody can say anything and anybody else can listen. So, you know, I, I, there are a number of things that I think are really valuable to think about right now because we are now at the, the real sticking point. We are at a point with WikiLeaks and with the Arab Awakening where the physical world is really starting to become terrified of cyberspace and is going to do everything it can to somehow subvert what is possible. What they're doing in the WikiLeaks case is phenomenal, given the fact that if you actually read those cables, and I've read an awful lot of them, they make the United States government look pretty good. They certainly make the people in the State Department look like they're much better writers than I thought. <laughs> and generally, what America is doing is not so bad. But because this was revealed, there's a young man who has been in solitary confinement since July of last year, where he's forced to stand naked much of the day and answer a question every five minutes because he revealed those, those cables. And they are going to go out and try to prosecute everybody who was associated with WikiLeaks. This is going to be a very serious engagement. Also, in the Arab Awakening, I just, I just had a, 
a marvelous opportunity to spend three days with a bunch of young Arab revolutionaries from the entire Mediterranean Rim, bloggers and, and Twitterers, who, many of whom had been jailed and tortured for what they were saying on their blogs, and were willing to go back and go on saying. And nobody was going to shut them up. And they were different from other people that had come before them in their cultures because they had had the opportunity to read what other people thought, because they had the opportunity to question, because they had a chance to see that they were not the only person who was sitting there in smoldering hatred at his government and at the police and at the powers that had been for creating a world where it was assumed that he was incapable of governing himself. And they had to be governed either by a thug or a mullah. And they refused that racist vision of themselves. And they came together and have so far, with one notable exception, where they really didn't have a great deal of choice, they have been unwilling to engage in violence because they knew that their real power was the ability to speak and, and be heard. And they knew that would make what would make life different for them over what it had been for many, many generations before them was that they inherently had the right to know. The right to know is a right that has never been promulgated before because it was simply impossible. But because of the internet, if we play our cards right, if we go on being vigilant, it will be possible for anybody on the planet to satisfy his curiosity to the fullest extent that is presently known by the rest of his species. Anybody who wants to know everything there is to know about a single species or a single element or any number of things can know everything that is presently known. And that is a profound shift in what it is to be human. Nothing like this has ever happened before. And unfortunately, there are many powers that are trying to keep it from happening because of very short-sighted interests. And I have to, to say in closing, this will not necessarily be a popular message, that the things that must be done in order to prevent the stifling of that incredible dream are going to be hard. One of them is that we're going to have to recognize that you cannot own free speech. That copyright, and I say this as somebody who makes a lot of his living from copyrighted material, copyright is the wrong model for monetizing the expression of the mind. Thought is not a thing. It is a verb. It is an action. It is something that naturally has a different economy from other things. Because the more a thought is heard and understood, the more powerful it becomes. It's not like physical goods. But because of the old model of thinking of expression as a thing that must be regulated towards scarcity, there are many, many things going on right now that are militating against freedom of expression, including the fact that many of you, I suspect, are Comcast subscribers, <laughs> since you, you don't have a choice in Marin County. Uh, well, you could go with AT&T, but they don't have any bandwidth. And they're also AT&T. Uh, but Comcast yesterday, they didn't issue a press release or anything, stopped all of our access to Pirate Bay. And Pirate Bay is a notorious copyright infringement site, but it's also a very strong political cause that has members of parliament in a number of different countries in, in Europe and a member of the European Union, uh, as, as a member of the, the European Commission. 
but it is now illegal by decree on the part of Congress to access pirate records. The other thing is that tolerance, unfortunately, is the right of that person you find most intolerable. That freedom of expression is the defense of that right. And, you know, that's a tough sell in Marin County where, you know, I used to have a bumper sticker that said, death to the intolerant. I had to take it off because nobody had a sense of irony about it. <laughs> it's too right on, brother. <laughs> no, it's not going to be like that, folks. And even though there is terrible stuff on the internet, and some of it just saddens me and makes me embarrassed to be a human, there is also wonderful stuff. The answer to hate speech is love speech. And the answer to the speech that you can't stand is the speech of your own heart. So you're going to have to go out there and defend those bastards. And you're going to have to go out there and stop those who would try to own human expression from asserting that short-term right. And I hope you'll also take a look at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We've been at this for a long time. We're winning. And so are our descendants.